Yummeri da hi, yummeri da hi, yummeri na 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 na. Hayeri da hi, yandiri da hi. Hare na 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 na, yandiri da hi, yandiri da hi. Hundred da ya, yandiri da hi, 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 yandiri da hi. Hai yandiri da, yandiri da, yandiri da, na 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 na, yandiri da, yandiri da, yandiri da, da 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 da, yandiri da, yandiri da, yandiri da, da 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 da, yandiri da, yandiri da, yandiri da, da da da, yandiri da, yandiri da, Shalom, shalom, beautiful friends. It's so great to see you. It's so great to be here with you. Thank you for joining. I'm a little out of breath, a little out of breath. That's good. So, <laughs> so we are very excited uh, to be at session number 34, session number 34, Antikva, the Chiat Yeush, being hopeful, rejecting despair, rejecting despair. Let's start with a poll question here for you. My sense of hope is rooted intellectually, spiritually, in my personality, or nah, I'm actually not so hopeful, right? So is your hope something that you have reached through thinking primarily? Is it through your spirit? Is it kind of in your personality who you've always been? Which would you say, or actually I'm not so hopeful? Let's see what you got there. Okay. Okay. 13% say intellectually, 38% say spiritually, 38% say in my personality, and 13% say nah, actually not so hopeful. Okay, friends, here we go. <clears throat> uh, Rebbe Nachman of Breslov was known for teaching a meta mitzvah that one should never despair. It was told by his students. That he would scream, Ein yeush be'olam kalau. There is no despair in the world. There is no despair. This is the big meta mitzvah. In a world of high anxiety, it is harder and harder for many of us to stay positive, focus on all that is good, and live with gratitude. Here, with a call to live with hope, means to remain positive despite evidence that leads us to be negative. We have an opportunity to live with emunah faith, bitachon, trust, and hope, tikva. Just in case you don't know those three Hebrew words, amuna, faith, bitachon, trust, and tikva, hope. Emily Dickinson wrote, hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tunes without the words and never stops at all. Living with a lack of hope means that our actions don't matter. Our lives perhaps don't matter, but having hope that our lives and actions, in fact, do matter is not a leap into the absurd. Oh, hope can be factually grounded from the meta view of the broad sweep of history. It is factually true that things generally get better. Consider history without democracy, without vaccinations, without medical technology, without error planes, right? There are things that are bad, but factually, things have gotten better on, on, on almost all fronts. Harvard professor Steven Pinker has argued that the world has become less violent. We can thus be optimistic and realistic at the same time. The Talmudic rabbis understood that we as humanity are interconnected. Here's what it says over here in the Midrash of Genesis Rabbah. A certain non-Jew asked Rav Yehoshua, you have festivals and we have festivals. We do not rejoice when you do, and you don't rejoice when we do. But we, when do we both rejoice together? Rabbi Yehoshua answered, when the rain falls. Right? That is such a beautiful idea that, you know, Muslims and Christians and Jews and Buddhists and Hindus, everyone's got different religions, excuse me, different uh, holidays. And yet in nature, we come together, right? When COVID, was all of us, we're all in it together, right? Doesn't matter what religion you are, COVID's there, right? Question is like, 
uh, you know, do we embrace that inevitable interconnectivity that is now experienced? Now more than ever before, we know our earth, air, and water, and our souls too are interconnected. We can find hope in this interconnectivity that we are all on this planet together as we are more and more aware of it. Consider, we can also find hope not only in our universalism, but in our particularism. Right? On the one hand, there's hope in our human solidarity. On the other hand, there could be hope in our particularism. Consider how even with all the despair in Egypt for the Israelite slaves, how many lived with hope? Consider how Yocheved, Moshe's mother, put Moshe in the basket, believing in a better future for him if she sent him away. Consider how Miriam, Moshe's sister, watches out for him. Consider, too, how Miriam brought instruments from Egypt with the hope that the time will come for music, right? How, friends, how amazing is this, right? You're leaving, you're leaving Egypt. You don't even have time to bake bread. That's why we have matzah, right? Because you're rushing, rushing, rushing. But Miriam and the women are like, uh-uh, we're rushing, but we're packing instruments. Why? Because even though we're rushing out of slavery, we are hopeful that we will get to the other side. And when we get there, we're going to be ready to sing. We're going to be ready to sing. I mean, what a demonstration of resiliency and hope and faith that Miriam and the women packed instruments on their way out of Egypt. It's also instructive to note that Pharaoh's daughter, Bitya, named the baby Moshe, using the active verb form, verb form, meaning one who draws others out, rather than Mashui, using the passive verb form, meaning he was drawn out. This would prove to be Moshe's strength to facilitate the drawing out of others in the form of freedom from slavery in Egypt and the subsequent exodus. Sephorno says that says this was Bitya's mandate to Moshe. Just like you were drawn out, you will draw out others. This was the hope she transmitted to Moshe. Consider how Anne Frank wrote about her experience in solitude and fear, right? Imagine a girl this young who's seeing what she is seeing and yet could write something like this in hiding. I keep my ideals because in spite of everything, I still believe that people are really good at heart. How wonderful it is that nobody wait a single moment before starting to improve the world. Think of all the beauty still left around you and be happy. Whoever is happy will make others happy too. I don't think of all the misery, but of the beauty that still remains. No one has ever become poor by giving. We all live in the objective of being happy. Our lives are all different and yet the same. Friends, on Tish above, a day of immense sadness, we read the book of Echa, Lamentations. Here is how Jeremiah, the author of Echa, depicts the city that sits alone. Let him, man, sit alone and keep silence because God has laid it upon him. Let him put his mouth in the dust. If so, there may be hope. Let him offer his cheek to the smiter. Let him be surfeited with, mo with mockery. Echa seems to imply that forced isolation and degradation is actually, was actually a foundation of hope for us. Let's also consider the story of Rabbi Akiva and his colleagues on the Temple Mount post-destruction, right? 2,000 years ago, the temple is destroyed, and what this famous story with Rabbi Akiva, they all see the same destruction, right? Jews are exiled, Jews are killed, the temple is destroyed. Judaism is done, right? Everyone thinks it's all over. It's all over, right? The Romans destroyed us. We, we had a good run. It's all over. They all see the same destruction that happened and the exile. Yet what does he see? Not everything in ruin. He sees at that moment of destruction a rebuilt future. Here's what it says over here. Another time they were going up to Jerusalem. When they reached Mount Scopus, they tore their clothes in mourning. When they reached the Temple Mount, they saw a jackal come out of the Holy of Holies. They began to cry, and Rabbi Akiva began to laugh. They said to him, why do you laugh? He said to them, why do you cry? They said to him, jackals, now walk upon the place of which it is written, and the stranger that comes near shall be put to death. Shall we not cry? He said to them, this is why I laugh. 
For it is written, and I took unto me faithful witnesses to record, Uriah the priest and Zechariah the son of, of Jeberechiah. What was Uriah to do with Zechariah? Uriah lived at the time of the first temple and Zechariah at the time of the second temple. Rather, the verse linked the prophecy of Zechariah to the prophecy of Uriah. Regarding Uriah, it is written, Therefore shall Zion, because of you, be plowed as a field. Regarding Zechariah, it is written, There shall yet the old men and old women dwell in the streets of Jerusalem. Until the prophecy of Uriah was fulfilled, I fear that the prophecy of Zechariah would not come to be. Now that the prophecy of Uriah has come to be, it is known that the prophecy of Zechariah will come to be. They, say, they said to him in these words, Akiva, you have comforted us. Akiva, you have comforted us. He saw this, they all saw destruction and they had despair. He saw destruction and he saw a hope in the future. Jews and the 3,300 year old project of Judaism as we know it, um, which really could be called 4,000 if you go even to, to Abraham, um, are pretty crazy. We are pretty Meshuggah. We believe in the most radical way that everything we do matters, that we must have hope and that we can and must change the world. Even though there's only about 13 million of us, roughly, we believe that every one of us matters in our national and global commitments to transform the world. Should we really be so radically hopeful? Edgar Allan Poe once wrote, men have called me mad, but the question is not yet settled whether madness is or is not the loftiest intelligence, whether much that is glorious, whether all that is profound, does not spring from disease of thought, from moods of mind exalted at the expense of the, of the general intellect. So perhaps it's the Jewish craziness that actually is our secret. We as a people are ambitious and we strive to excel beyond the norm. Albert Einstein said, great spirits have always encountered violent opposition from mediocre minds. We are a people with a bold task and the rigorous ethical and religious demands of the Torah. And we believe that we are free and capable of changing the world. Animosity from small minds will always assail us, and others may remain aloof. Sometimes we also we may also be challenged by our own lack of personal autonomy and sense of responsibility. Um, I'm sure many of you recall the infamous case of Kitty Genovese, who in 1964 was raped and murdered in New York City as dozens of people watched from their windows and did nothing. Social psychologists have showed that the larger the number of bystanders, the less likely we are to intervene to help one another. Perhaps we see that others are not helping, so we need not help. Or perhaps we feel that someone else has probably responded um, or maybe will be better equipped to help, so we don't need to help. We are social beings, and at times, social conformity can have disastrous results. Rather than live with the bold goal of actualizing our individual responsibility and giving others hope, too often we live with the goal of avoiding shame, avoiding taking risks, or doing anything new or different from that which is done all around us. The shortest question in the Torah is remarkably God's first question in the Torah. It is a question asked in Genesis 3.9. Adam and Eve had just eaten some fruit from the forbidden tree, and sensing God's presence in the Garden of Eden, they hid among the trees. While they were hiding, God asked Adam a one-word question. Ayeka, where are you? It takes three English words to get there, but the one Hebrew word gets you there. Ayeka, where are you? This is a question only those with courage ask themselves each year. Where am I? Am I just getting by? eating, sleeping, working, seeking instant gratification? Or am I driven by a greater purpose? Am I aware every day that what I do with my life truly matters? There is indeed an urgency to find ourselves. When we arise each day from bed, we are to say, as did Avraham, he named me, here I am. I'm alive. I've got a mission. We know that we cannot resolve all the problems of the world but we also know that we can and must try our best. As the rabbis famously teach, it is not upon you to complete the task, but neither are you free to desist from it. One of the great sicknesses thriving today in the 21st century is 
cynicism. Ever seen it? Someone who thinks that nothing is important, nothing matters, nothing needs to change or can change. Things are really just fine as they are, or maybe terrible, but beyond hope, not worth improving. This is perhaps the most un-Jewish approach to life and the most uninspired way to live. It's a sickness that spreads to, to all others around us, where everything becomes a joke rather than a holy opportunity to engage. Rambam, Maimonides teaches that we should view our lives as if our very next action will determine whether the world is redeemed or destroyed. Now, how many of us really believe that our next action could have this kind of impact? And even if one does not believe this to be literally true, Rambam is nevertheless instructing us that this is a way to see the world and live our lives. We are to live as though everything matters, we, that every person matters. We live with hope and faith and possibility. I think of my friend and teacher, Oscar in Guatemala, who I met many years ago, about 20 years ago. Oscar lost all of his family in the war. Oscar's friends all around him gave up. There was no more meaning. There was no more hope. <laughs> there was no more purpose. Somehow, Oscar found the courage and inspiration to protest this mentality. And today, Oscar travels from poor village to poor village around his country of Guatemala, helping the leadership to build their communities. Oscar saw the bait to deny hope and to be stuck in the past. He resisted, and he's a faith hero. The Hasidic master, Rav Chaim of Trozno from Poland, a close student of the Baal Shem Tov, used to love to watch a certain rope dancer with awe and attentiveness. One day, his student asked him why he spent so much free time watching the man dancing high upon a rope. He responded that this person, while risking his life, could not be thinking for even a moment about the 100 golden coins he, would, he, was, gonna, he was going to earn, because then he would fall. <clears throat> and that this is how we should view our lives, that we are all walking on a very thin rope. At any moment, it can all be over for us. If we remember this, then we'll, we'll always have to be focused on the big things that really matter, that our lives are deeply sacred and short. Rav Shlomo of Karlin, the second Karliner Rebbe, once explained that the greatest invitation to the Yetzirah, the inclination to do evil within us, is that we forget that we are the children of the king. We are not without value or purpose. We are here because God brought us into being with love and gave us work to do, saying in a quiet voice, bring a fragment of my presence into other lives. We are free to respond, hineni, with deep integrity as we answer the question, ayeka. We have the ability and freedom to choose our lives. After all, the absolute foundation of Jewish philosophical commitment is that we are free. This message is not always clear because unfortunately, as we've shared, the great and three great advocates of determinism, Karl Marx and Baruch Spinoza and Sigmund Freud, were Jews. They were Jews. Karl Marx argued that our behavior is determined by structures and power uh, of power in society, among them the ownership of property. This is called economic determinism. Baruch Spinoza argued that human conduct is given by the instincts we acquire at birth. This is called genetic determinism. Sigmund Freud argued that we are shaped by our early childhood experiences. This is called psychological determinism. But determinism, determinism leads to excuses and a sense of despair. We know that we are affected by our culture, by the economy, by our upbringing, by our genes, of course, and so much more. But Judaism comes to tell the world there's no excuses. There's no excuses. You're free. You have choice. You're responsible. You can transcend your reality. And, and, and we can answer with the call, Hineni. Adam's first response is the denial of freedom. The woman gave it to me, he says, oh, it's her fault, right? God says, where are you? He says, oh, she did it. And Eve's first response also denies freedom. She says, the serpent duped me. Neither of them believed they were free, or at least that God was dumb enough that could be duped. The Torah is warning us at the outset that at the core of human nature is the need to give excuses and to deny our freedom for how we choose to live. We are charged to live with hope, 
It is after all hope and refusing to succumb to despair that brought about the creation of the state of Israel. It's not for naught that Israel's national anthem focuses on and is even titled Hatikva, the hope. It is that that very hope that keeps Israel alive and thriving today and Jewish people around the world. Yes, ours is an active hope, not a passive hope, where we do all we can to improve ourselves, our family, our community, and our world. And alongside that effort, we never let go of the dream, the hope, the promise that we can bring light to darkness, that things can get better, better, and that we will collectively heal. Okay, my dear friends, on this topic of how can we inspire more kindness in the world and how can fo actively fostering a sense of hope contribute to that? I would love to hear your thoughts and comments and disagreements. Hi, Rabbi. Hi, Ethan. I'll, I'll start us off here. Um, <clears throat> I, I loved your, your presentation. Um, I found hope from it, so thank you for that. Um, I, I am interested, um, just, just a few moments ago, you spoke about how the fundamental value of Judaism is this concept of freedom, that we have the ability to pursue the life that we believe is for us, that we should not have excuses. Um, inherently, I love that, and I believe in that. Um, I have also seen that type of rhetoric weaponized against people who the systems are unjustly positioned against them. Um, take, for example, a Black American who lives uh, in a society which, you know, doesn't give them the ability to access loans for their homes and therefore doesn't send them to educational systems. And a, a weaponized response is, well, why don't they just work harder? Um, they, they should, you know, they can just make it, you know, take, take, for example, the people who have gotten out, they, they shouldn't have an excuse. There are plenty of people who have worked hard and they have made it. Um, I am wondering how we, we conceptualize and how we grapple with, uh, the blessing in, of that concept to be free, while on the other hand, acknowledging that there are folks who are not free, um, who we need to fight for. Um, and we need to seek justice for. Beautiful, Ethan. I'm so glad you went in that direction. That is so helpful um, because that is is so crucial to what this exactly exactly this session is about. <clears throat> in regards to uh, that, fundamental to our hope is the notion of our freedom, and that that very freedom is used not to just be grateful, but to uh, perpetuate freedom on deeper levels to understand that social barriers are real, to understand as the American legal system does have, that there are real mitigating factors as to um, how people chose, to, why people chose to do what they did. People steal for very different reasons. People kill for very different reasons. And there are mitigating factors that ought to reduce sentences based upon um, uh, aspects that reduce their freedom to do what they do. Now, I know some people are in the camp of, Kanye should get a pass. Kanye can hate as much as he wants because mental illness and mental illness gives you a pass for whatever you want. You know, so Kanye can hate on Jews. He can hate on whoever he wants because he gets the mental illness pass. And I know um, and I know other people who feel like, yeah, mental illness is real, um, it, but it doesn't give you a pass on everything. Right. Just like poverty is real, but it doesn't give you a pass in everything. Um, and so um, how do we balance that? How do we balance thinking about the real social barriers, the real mitigating factors, the real limitations on freedom that people have intellectually, psychologically, economically, racially, and really account for those? And yet at the same time, hold up this spiritual ideal um, of freedom. And like many of our topics, I think a big part of the answer is what we do with ourselves versus what we say to others, right? I don't think we should go around saying to others, don't make excuses when people are complaining about their suffering or their challenges, right? We should say, I'm in solidarity with you and your challenges. I think what we say to ourselves is no excuses. I, I gotta take responsibility for my life. And in a mentorship role or in a parenting role or in an educational role, we might think about how to bring that in as well. 
right? But I don't think it's our role to tell other groups, for example, um, or people in very different life experiences than our own, um, that exactly what you said, pick yourselves up from your bootstraps. And so, but on the other hand, I don't think we can give, give up the ideal of freedom because some people pervert it. Because there are people who pervert the noble idea of freedom um, in a way that says, oh, you're free, go work harder, right? So it means we should reject that, but we shouldn't reject the noble ideal of freedom at the same time, right? Um, and just like laziness last week, we said we shouldn't go around yelling at people that they're lazy, right? But we ourselves can hold ourselves accountable to have a more disciplined life. Um, so I think it's kind of a, a kind of a kind of a, a similar thing there. I, you think you want to follow up on that, or? Um, no, I'll, I'll let the other folks jump in and maybe respond when they're done. Okay, great. Let's go to Lauren and then um, uh, Glaya and Eileen. It's human resilience, I think that that gives us hope, those that can do it. Because when I think of, <coughs> I grew up among Holocaust survivors and these are people who survived at a cost, they went through a hell. We can't imagine, but think about it. They, they moved to a new land, they raised a family, they had children. I mean, I find that remarkable. You know, they reconstructed their lives. Some of them moved to Israel help create the state. I mean, they just came, they got out of the camps and here they are fighting in the war of independence. I, I think it's totally remarkable totally. and it could only be based on hope because if you gave up, they wouldn't have done it. You I know? think that's it's exactly just right, Lauren. I think awesome. we should be so proud. We should be pr so proud of the 20th century uh, Jews on what they achieved post-Holocaust with American Jewish life and influence, with the building of the state of Israel, right? What many groups may have done, I'm not pointing fingers at any groups, right? What, what, what any nation may have done, people may have done, was put their hands up, throw up hope, like it's all over. And the second half of the 20th century, in terms of what Jews did globally, is just remarkable, is just remarkable. Now, I don't see this, I don't say this from a spirit of Jewish exceptionalism, um, but but the pride of what refugees achieved, right, around the world and here, in the fields of science, in Hollywood, in politics, in entrepreneurship, um, in, in, in literature, in literally every field, in nation building. It's, that doesn't mean that there weren't flaws there, too, and, you know, things to point, look, look at. But I think it's exactly right. And I think uh, Nobel Prizes, yeah. And I think that um, there's a lot of factors that go into something like that. But no, certainly one of them is um, this this hope, like you said. Like, you, I mean, who comes out of the crematorium, the gas chambers, and just says, "Let's rebuild." And to be sure, some couldn't. Some lived in deep poverty. They they were really paralyzed the rest of their lives. There's very different refugee stories out there, of course. But I appreciate Lauren you bringing that in because I think it's um, those those people were heroes. Uh, those people who were, you know, some of our parents and grandparents, cousins. Um, and and what they were able to do. Aglaya, hi Aglaya. Okay, so you went there with history, so I get to go there with history. So, all right, now, first of all, just to be, you know, am I feeling hopeful today? I'll just get it out there. Am I feeling hopeful today? Not really, but I think it's just because I'm not in the best mood today, but that's a little different, okay? Now, when it comes to having these discussions with students, my classes turn into group therapy every time something ridiculous happens in the world. Okay, Putin invades Ukraine. Well, I'm the therapist. Kanye West says something yet again that is absolutely hateful and ridiculous. I ended up having to have group therapy sessions about that also. So it is um, one of the things that I've noticed is that I have had to say all of the, like a lot of the same things you've said today. Two students who are like writing to me like, oh my God, the world's going to come to an end and I'm going to get drafted and I'm going to, everything's going to go to hell and all this other stuff though. And I'm like, look, chill kid <laughs> we got to step back a few and then you know just say look um it's not we're still here we've survived all of this stuff before we're going to survive more of that, that kind of stuff however though um there's also the um i guess weird way of looking at it from the perspective my just weird paradoxical way of looking at things is that you know i'm not i'm telling people this but do i necessarily feel it mm, not all of the time and so in my case, the way that I look at it is um, 
uh, like I said, weird paradoxical thinking that I have, this kind of feeling of despair that I have actually is still the same hope that I have. It's just, you know, like expressed in a different way. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know. But then again, here's the thing that is that one of the things that is, you know, great about Judaism is that it can take any paradox and go all and go everywhere with it. So I'm just throwing that one out there. Want to take it? <laughs> Good. Thank you, Aglaya. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. And 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 what I also appreciate in how you concluded is um, that at, based on, uh, you know, the reason I used the poll question I did was because <clears throat> some of us may be able to muster kind of intellectually arguments for hope, whereas in our personality, it's just not there. Or Or spiritually, we can get there, but intellectually, we can't explain it. Right. And so sometimes we have to find the faculty emotionally or intellectually or or spiritually that kind of can help us to foster a productive discourse forward, um, e even when some other faculties of our being are kind of, you know, living, living paradoxically, as you said, um, with that tension. And that is totally normal. That is totally normal for us to hold despair and hope at the same time for us to look at the evidence and see conflicting data. Right. On the one hand, you can look at enormous progress of the 20th century. On the other hand, you can look at like like the Holocaust and World War Two, you know, and um, and those are both true. Right. Just like um, there's people living very different lives right now, lives that represent a lack of progress and lives that represent enormous progress at the same moment. Um, yes. Over to you, Eileen. Hi. Um, many years ago, I taught in Chicago inner city schools. I taught at a school that was only for girls who were drug addicts, pregnant, um, mentally handicapped, emotionally handicapped. The majority of these girls were black. They came from impoverished families. They had absolutely no support or resources systems. And I felt that it was my job to instill in these girls some type of discipline, order, and perhaps hope. And the fact that I taught home ec and cooking meant if they behaved, they got to eat. And that was primal for them. Um, I could have taught in any other school. I actually chose this school because I felt I wanted to contribute. I have no idea where these girls ended up, but I can only hope that I instilled in them some virtues. Thank you, Eileen. And um, what, what, one of the many things that I have noticed, um, and I'm certainly not the first to have noticed, of those who actually made a crucial choice in their emerging adulthood to go on a different path than their peers was often a mentor, a teacher who believed in them, someone who saw something that they could be more, someone who sat with them and listened to them, someone who didn't just give them an abstract sense of hope but a deep sense of solidarity and of presence that somebody uh, believed in them. And I'm sure you gave that. And, um, and I, I hear of that again and again, of, of that type of intervention being perhaps the most crucial, more than any great lecture or class, that someone there saw them, that they could be more than they currently are. And I, um, I remember, I'll share just one moment like that in my life, I was a senior in high school, and we were um, kind of like teasing these freshmen in high school, like in a way that was kind of, we thought was just playful. It was like they wanted our attention because they thought we were cool seniors. And so we had them doing push-ups in a group, and they were excited, like, oh, yeah. And and um, and this, this <laughs> the, uh, uh, but I mean, today, you know, and they were laughing, and they thought it was funny, but it was, it was problematic. Like, we're in a, and, and a teacher who I deeply respected, made eye contact with me from across the courtyard and looked at me. And those eyes, because he believed in me, um, it, it, they, they, that one second of eye contact changed my life. And um, because he, he, he looked at me in a way of like, I know you, like, this is not you, you're better than that, you know? 
And it really shook me. I'm like, whoa, how did I like get into a social pattern of like participating in something problematic like this? And his eye contact of like, I, I believe in you, you're more than this, like really, really changed me. You know, uh, one of my favorite things to do is speak in prisons. And I spoke in a prison a month ago, uh, about two hours south of, of our office, uh, down in maybe an hour and a half, Florence. <clears throat> and uh, um, and I, I shared with some folks that I received a letter from an inmate a week ago, one of the inmates there. And it was a long letter and really had a lot to say, powerful things to say about the challenges of faith in the prison and, and uh, you know, his goals and aspirations after. And But then he kind of closed with saying, um, look, the, the Department of Corrections only pays me 45 cents an hour for my work, which is a separate conversation. Let's bracket that, bracket that conversation for a second. 45 cents an hour for my work in the prison. Um, but I want to donate to you. How can I do that to donate to your work? And I thought, wow, like that's not just inspiring, like on a sacrifice level, whatever he's saving for when he gets out in 10 years from now, but on the level of saying like, like the, like I believe, I, like, I, I think in some ways, just like having a child is a, is an act of faith, uh, of hope in the future. You say, I believe this world is worthy enough that bringing a child would be a good, this would be a good place for them to live. So too, like donating is a way that like, I believe investing in the good, right, is such a great act of hope and faith. And for someone in the despair of prison to be like, I can't even access the outside world, but I want to invest in it, right, is inspired me so deeply. Hi, Toby. Hi, Rabbi. I, I think you really um, hit the nail on the head as far as that goes. Many people don't have, have never had role models. They grew up in an environment which was dysfunctional. They never could look to anybody, a, a relative or a teacher or a friend who, who stood with them. And I, I don't mean, you know, here, here's a toothbrush and whatever. I don't mean that. I mean to actually stand with the person and say, look, I think you can do this. So let's, let's make a plan and let's, Let's do it. And that takes a human, you know? It's all the money in the world. You can toss money at things and I'm not opposed to that because it, you know, you need that too. You need yeah. that too in order to do the other things. Yeah. But you, there seems to be a lack of like live humans, um, even video humans. And I'm, I mean, I'm not even separating out the, the prison population and my, my people, you know, yeah. um, that I worked with for years. I'm talking about, what happened to seniors during the pandemic? These mm -hmm. people were all alone. They're stuck in their house. They mm -hmm. don't have relatives. They don't have, you know, um, it's. Uh... This is this is Toby. Yeah, thank you. If I, if I had the budget for this, boy, would I love to build a massive mentorship program um, that matched people up in the deepest deepest of ways. Oh yeah, we're gonna go to Gary next, um, and then and then Ethan, um, and, because I think you're exactly right. And um, you know, it's funny. I just had this conversation with my nine year old daughter. She's struggling with teachers and coaches that think she hasn't done a good job, and she has interpreted that as as many children will as they don't like me, they don't care about me, they're telling me I'm not doing good enough, I'm not good enough. They tell me I'm not running fast enough. They tell me I I didn't get I didn't do well enough on my math test. And we're trying to flip this to, wow, like someone who is going to critique your work, someone who is going to push you, what a gift that is. Yes, and there's many different ways to critique that are productive or non-productive or to push that are productive or not. But the gift of people who care enough to push you, right? Because sometimes we think the person who likes us best is the one who tells us we're great. Right. But actually, the one who's going to actually be there, be like, I believe you can be more than you are I, or, or more than you're performing. I believe you're capable of more than you're doing now. And boy, do a lot of us lose that. And we just fall into the trap of just wanting to be told, great job, great job. You're perfect. Right. But to believe in someone and push them on a consistent basis, because the pusher sometimes, if they're a decent person, hates the pushing even more than the push does. Right. Like the last thing I want to do is push is push my kids. But I believe in them so greatly of, of what they can be. So how do we push in a way that's so loving and so gentle and that conveys a sense of I believe in you? And and uh, so anyways, much more on that mentorship. But yeah, over to Gary and then Ethan. Good morning, everyone. Uh, a couple of things. 
not not to be I, I happen to agree with it what everybody is saying here but to be a little bit of a contrarian uh I, I just you know hope we understand here where hope is but if we look at our American society and other societies around the world at the moment uh uh one that bothers me is is the hope of the far right uh and even beyond that where mm. They see hope as, wow, we're going to get this president in, or we're going to get this political thing in, or we're going to pass this to continue to either take away people's rights uh, or continue to dis disenfranchise them mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, we're going to take away, we're, uh, we have hope that this person or this legislation will uh, uh, stop immigrants from coming or uh, uh, continue to keep a lid on those that are impoverished or in minority groups. Uh, and, you know, they read the text completely different than than we do here of about having hope. Uh, and my hope is that that just continues. I, I understand there's always people like that in society, but it seems that that's getting larger, uh, their idea of hope, than, than what we're talking about here. Yeah. Uh, and in terms of mentorship, uh, I've always loved Maimonides. And his uh, thirteen. No, that's 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 something else. The the whole idea of sadaka and the ultimate is to set somebody up so that they can indeed provide for themselves, teach them, teach them a trade or what, whatever we want. We we want to say that. And the third thing, you know, I, I taught in the medical school for a long, long time, and uh, you know, I, a lot of people said I was really mean and uh, was it nice, uh, which never really affected me because I know just the opposite, but my goal, and I used to tell them, was to obtain, uh, my job was to make sure they become the, the best uh, doctors that they could. And by letting them slide uh, and not knowing their work or pushing them uh, didn't create anything uh, other than just complacency. Uh, and we have to strive. We Some people, oh, well, I think most people need to be pushed. And obviously there's, with your daughter, there's a nice way and there's not a nice way, but we're in a society where everybody gets a happy face, you know? So even even if you don't do well, you get a happy face because we're worried about their self-esteem rather than teaching them that they're part of the world. And that's how we that's how we improve the world by reaching out and improving ourselves, which then improves others. That's all I have. Love it, Gary. And I, I, I can't imagine someone possibly saying you're not nice, but let's bracket that conversation for the moment. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, so I, just to, to, to think about both of your points. Yes, on this on the second page. Wow, what a beautiful art to cultivate how to um, elevate someone's self-esteem and feel loved and cared about while at the same time really pushing them and having them know that um, they're capable of more. And um, we know people on both extremes, those who just give a pass on everything and because they really don't care um, or don't want to do the messy work. And those who will push too hard in a way that leaves everyone just feeling yucky. But on your first point, I, I, I love that you brought this up because there is bad hope, right? Every virtue can be perverted for, for, um, for evil, as we've talked about, about, about in each of these cases. <laughs> for example, think about climate uh, change deniers. Oh, I got hope. It's all gonna work out. I don't have to worry about it. Like it's gonna, like it's just gonna work out. Like enjoy, uh, enjoy whatever you want to use, right? No, like um, actually, there's going to be major interventions in terms of how our countries live and operate. Uh, you know, individually uh, as groups and systemically to turn this around um, in any way. Or think about like you brought up the MAGA hope, the hope that we're gonna return to an all white led society, right? These the, so hope itself. It's like technology. It's not inherently good or bad. It's what it's what it's hoped for. Just as important as cultivating hope is cultivating hope for the right things, right? And then actively creating a system to of actions to back up so it's not a passive hope, but an active hope. So I love that you brought that up because um, I think we should always be clear in cultivating these virtues, what we're cultivating them for. Just like laziness, right? Going back to the last one, right? It's great to be disciplined, but you can be really disciplined to do horrible things. The Nazis um, were incredibly organized and disciplined and had, um, uh, a, 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 you know, uh, great decorum and, 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 and regimen. So um, all these virtues can be pervert, perverted in horrible ways. And, uh, and, yeah, and so there again, one of the great things about mentorship is someone who could tell us when we're straying from um you know some of the the moral boundaries thank you so much gary hi ethan 
Hey, Rabbi. Um, yeah, I was also going to reflect, Gary, that I'd like to meet these people who said you weren't nice. I, I can't believe that. Um, I, I wanted to, to reflect back um, as I lean, um, Toby Aglaya, Rabbi, and Gary, I've found all of your comments helpful as I've been continuing to think about the question that I posed. And sort of if you think about the extremes of hope as like the eternal optimist who believes for themselves that I just need to be tough and I can figure this out. Um, and the ultra realist, on the other hand, who evaluates the situation for the purpose, for, for the person and at hand and, and may in some cases understand that you know progress may not be possible without change um i would like to propose that a, an addendum to the the concept of hope um and and that addendum i think is that once we have found hope for ourselves um that that cannot be the end of our hope gary i think when you when you speak about the hope um you know, ultra conservatives and, and other, you know, uh, hateful groups. To me, that hope is very rooted in a, um, a self-focused concept of the world. Um, my world is going to look how I want it for me, and therefore it's hopeful for me. Um, but what I'm proposing is, um, is that our hope can't just stop with us. Um, I think about a line from the, the Declaration of Independence, which paraphrased essentially says that those who have the ability to act, therefore innately have the responsibility to act. And I would like to propose that we should think about hope in terms of the, that concept, that if we have the privilege to be hopeful, then the last step of hope is that we have to share it with others so that maybe their worlds can change in a way that they too can become hopeful. Um, I think one of the beautiful things about Judaism is that we fundamentally believe that we are a privileged people. Like we, we say for ourselves that we are the chosen people. Um, we, we are lucky to have been chosen by God for the, the commandment to bring light to the world. And so if we eternally believe that we are lucky to have this hope, that we cannot just sit with that hope for ourselves, but we have to give it out to others who need that hope from us. Um, and I think that that may ultimately be the final step of hope is is sharing it out to the world. So that's what I've been Thank thinking you. about in, in reflection there. Yeah. Thank you. You know, it reminds me of a study I saw recently about the best way to cultivate empathy in children. And, and the answer is not um, to preach empathy or talk about empathy. According to this one study, the best way to teach empathy for young kids is to meet their needs, because when they experience their need being met, <clears throat> they become more equipped to see what, what that feels like and looks like and meet the needs of others. So, too, um, uh, the answer is not, oh, let's go promote hope and teach hope. But actually, how do we help others find a pathway out of despair? And sometimes that's through helping them. Right. We, if we want someone to live with faith, we don't go preach faith. We be kind to them. Right. That when one has received kindness, when one has received support, they are able to kind of imagine a world that actually lives like that. That right. Many people who can't live with hope, it's because they've been burnt so many times by people and hurt so many times that it's hard to rebuild a, a faith in humanity or a hope that things can be any better than they have been. Right. But in, in experience something better, right? It opens up a whole new pathway of imagination. And so I love what you said about the responsibility of the privileged who have always kind of had a sense of hope of how to pass that forward by taking care, by, by helping take care of others and find that. Good, we have Eddie, then we have Vicky. Thank you, Rabbi. Uh, can you explain the difference between faith and hope? Well, I am glad you brought that up, and I'm also uh, going to, I'm looking at the schedule here, I am also going to punt, because in two sessions, we have Imuna Ubitachon, Holding Faith and Trust, and in that session, we will actually look how faith and trust themselves are fundamentally different phenomena from uh, from hope, and um, uh, and how we will kind of contrast 
cultivating those as different resiliency tools can make us better agents of kindness. And so I'm going to punt, but in great appreciation that you actually, uh, you know, helped us to look forward. <laughs> Hi, Vicki. Hi, Rabbi. First of all, thank you to you for inspiring the great conversation and to everybody else who's participated. The only thing I'm going to add, and first of all, Eddie, that was one of my questions. So I look forward to the session, two sessions from now, Rabbi. Um, but it's just that the first thing I thought about was this notion of all things great and small. And that therefore we have to keep our eyes on the big picture, on what we would hope for in the future, on how we really would like to see the world. I know beyond, you know, you can see you know, the, the big values of justice, of fairness, of, you know, uh, alleviation of suffering, et cetera, et cetera. And then the second part is really our responsibility that Gary and others talked about is what we can do. Those are the small things. And to your point about instilling empathy, I would take it just a step further that I think if you think about how you act in this world, how you walk through this world, go back to Anne Frank, um, I think that is in small ways of being purposeful and intentional and about how you carry yourself and how you reach out to others is maybe a way for all of us. It's not to say there aren't big problems and we need bigger solutions, but I think each of us can in some ways, as Eileen just said, to model kindness, just to model certain behaviors. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, love that, love that. And so I hope if we take away anything is not me just trying to convince us, oh, we should all be hopeful or, or, you know, but rather to think about how this vehicle can foster more kindness, how this vehicle of enabling people who don't hold hope to find it. And what does it look like? What are the great nuances that help us get there? Just before I see if folks who haven't spoken yet, like Sarah or and Steve um, want to weigh in, the one, the one um, little... Um, uh, snippet I'll give to, to looking forward to Anadi's question is perhaps hope is based on what we already know on some level, whereas faith is dealing with the uncertainty dimension based on what we don't know. And how do we build um, a, 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 a sense of what the future entails based on what we know? And how do we base it based on something um, that we don't know? So Steve or Sarah, either of you want to jump in at all here? Yeah, I Hi. Thank you. Um, I, I had a little bit of a different experience, and uh, it had to do with a fellow for whom I volunteered. And I wound up not wanting to prevent his despair. Let me let me explain that a little bit. His life followed a trajectory of total despair, hatred, Someone came in and was an advocate for him as a child. He then, he, he then prospered, succeeded, reached higher levels than he ever dreamed of. And then he fell into despair again because everybody he knew died. The fellow was 96 years old. And it, it's inevitable. A lot of your friends and family will be gone. And he, he said, I, I right now cannot get from people uh, a, a sense of, of worth and value. He, he depended on other people to imbue him with, with feelings of, of value. His parents did not do that. And he said, when everybody died, I lost that. And, and now I'm very close to despair. And, and I, I kept thinking, do I want? Is it my role to allow him to despair? Uh, and then he, he said to me, and, and this is kind of complicated, he said, I don't want to hate my parents. So I don't want to talk about them. And, and please prevent me from going to, into despair. Like I'm a psychologist, I was just a guy. Um, <laughs> don't allow me to go into despair. And so I, I kind of wrestled with it. Should I allow him? He wants to go into despair, but he doesn't want to go into despair. And and I'm kind of, of mm. weaving like like a running back in football. I'm, I'm, mm. I'm, I'm looking for a place to settle down and score a touchdown. And I can't figure out where this is going. But this guy had despair and I just wanted to be quiet and let him voice his feelings or, or not voice them. 
I, I, everything matters, as you said, everything we do matters. I, um, I love that you shared that because I think um, there's the Ba'asher Husham idea that we meet people where they're at, right? We don't try to change them or tweak their feelings or beliefs. We just sit with them and meet them where they're at, Ba'asher Husham. And then there's the idea of what we said on the other hand, this idea of mentorship, this idea of relationship, where if we care about someone, we're willing to engage and intervene at times. And how do we balance those? The guy wants to go to despair. So we want to just support where they want to go. And we also know um, how many pathways will close for someone when they when they lock themselves in a cell of despair. And so how do we how do we hold on to that? Yeah, thanks, Aglaia, for sharing that also. And so um so and so and so uh, there are different, it's like being a ninja, like there are these different moments of how we use our body and at the right moment to engage each right moment it's um and to really see what's happening and 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 how to respond and i'm sure steve you're one of the best at navigating that i, I know um I've, I've experienced it so so thank you for sharing that and those of us who sit with people who are having a hard time which is all of us um um you know try to try to strike that balance um you know, it's uh, um, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to to live both with empathy um, and also where that empathy is not enough, and um, and someone needs support beyond just the empathy. So, okay, Sarah, you're gonna get the last uh, last voice here. Well, it actually sounds like Steve's old man um, had hope. He was hoping to be kept from despair. And, and the one thing we are implored to do is to not judge hope. We all have our own, somewhere on the spectrum of hope, one hopes. And I, I've been deeply into process theology recently. And so it's, you know, everything changes. And we take the lure, we go somewhere, and we change. And if we haven't gone in the direction that God, the lure, life wants us to go, we have another opportunity. And the only time we actually don't have hope is when we're dead. So um, I think there's always some kind of hope. And the, I think the greatest problem we might have is judging what that hope looks like when it doesn't meet our needs and doesn't meet our mental picture of where we want this world to go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Vicki, is that an old hand up or a new hand? That's an old hand. Okay. Okay. Sarah, thank you for that. And I love that point about not judging. People are in different places on the hope spectrum and us being sensitive to that um, uh, is really powerful. And I think us also to become students of how hope is politicized. It's false hope. I mean, think about a coyote who's giving people a sense that I will bring you across this border to the American dream, right? And um, and how people are selling hope left and right, MAGA, MAGA and, and the left, but also the far left goes the opposite way. And as I, you know, I, I critique the far right. Let me say a critique of the far left, where sometimes <clears throat> the less hope you have, the more, the more legitimate of an activist you are, right? The, the, you are more woke if everything is more broken than you imagined, right? And I, I, I've been talking about this more and more because I've been seeing it all the time that, oh, that you thought democracy is struggling, it's dead. You thought that Israel was going in the wrong direction, Israel's a failed enterprise. Right? You thought that climate change, we only have, have 30 years left, we got five. Right? The worse you make it sound, the more legit of an activist you are. And we should reject that too. Just like selling false hope is dangerous, so too making things sound a lot worse than they may be is also very dangerous. And so not only should we actively try to cultivate this virtue for good, but we should become students of how people are politicizing hope and using it as a tool for those um, who can be duped and, and be led down paths of extremism in different ways. God bless you all. Always great to be with you. You give me, you truly give me a sense of hope. I, I don't mean that as a joke. I get a sense of hope from all of you and 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 your uh, and your depth. Have a great day. God bless. <laughs>